Let's start at the beginning. Last week, Jamie introduced our current topic, <coughs> pointing out that we all have a part to play in the body of Christ here in Whitchurch, and given an outline of the gifts that the Holy Spirit bestows on each of us, so that we can each play our part as a member of that body. One of his PowerPoint slides listed 20 different gifts and where they were mentioned in the Bible. Does anybody remember that slide? I do. <laughs> Jamie does. <laughs> I do, because I borrowed it from him. Um, I was going to ask if you could give me the list, but obviously <laughs> I won't bother. Um, there it is, Jamie's list of 20 different gifts and where we may find them mentioned in the Bible. Each of those 20 is mentioned at least once in the four texts that you see above. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4. The one we're going to look at today, and we are only going to look at one, I'm not going to look at all 20, you'll be pleased to hear. That one is leading. The particular text where you may find <coughs> leading mentioned as a gift is Romans 12, which says in verse 6, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy. And in verse 8, it says, if it is to lead, do it dil diligently. And I've marked the bit that says, if your gift is to lead, do it diligently. The other bit that comes in between is about other things. So we're thinking about leading. And leading is a gift. It's a gift that's given to, well, I won't say, should I say some? Should I say everyone or something in between? But here's a question for you. What's a leader? What makes somebody a leader? What does a leader need? Well, I could tell you. Leaders need... That's exactly what I said, Roger. Thank you. Leaders need followers. If you don't have followers... You're not a leader. <clears throat> the shepherd is a leader of sheep. Without them following, it'd just be a man going for a walk. To show that the picture isn't just somebody walking past some sheep, there is a bit later. Uh, it's amazing. I took this picture ooh, way back, 2000 and something, eight, nine, Sue, I was hoping Sue would remember, <laughs> she can't remember it either, uh, it's taken in Nazareth, and Jamie was mentioning earlier the sheep and the goats, the black one is a goat, all the rest are sheep, but the go he has a goat with him, and he hasn't yet separated them, and the goat, I can tell you, was the one that pushed all the others out of the way to try and get the food he had in his hand. <clears throat> but let's carry on. with Without followers, without followers, he wouldn't be a shepherd. Without followers, Donald Trump, who was probably once the most powerful leader in the world, would have just been a man standing on a rostrum shouting platitudes to nobody in particular. Without a hundred or so children following her, Gladys Aylward would have just been a woman escaping over the mountains. But they followed her. And more than that, she encouraged them to keep going and carried many of the children who were tired. Leaders... Make a note of that. Sometimes we need to carry people. If you haven't read her story, it's a truly inspiring so story. 
of somebody who people thought wasn't capable of much, but who the Lord inspired and gifted for leadership and great works. It's well worth reading if you haven't read it. So what else does a leader need? Or what do they need to be doing? They need followers. They also need to have authority or oversight in the area or organisation where they're leading. I have to say, this list isn't a biblical list. This is my thoughts, and it's by no means exhaustive. They also need to be able to give help and guidance, specifically and generally. They need to be capable of doing things themselves. And particularly, they need to be capable and they need to encourage helping, training and encouraging others to carry out those tasks. And that, of course, is a particularly important part of the job for leaders because if they don't train new leaders, which that's part of, Who's going to take over when they're too tired or old, like me, or <coughs> unwilling to do the job themselves? That leads us on to another question. How should a leader behave? We've said what they should do, or some of the things they should do. How should they behave? What is it about their behaviour that marks them out as a leader? If you answer that question from a secular point of view, you will find the qualities can differ greatly from those for church leaders, which are given from a biblical point of view. Let's compare them. Secular leaders are either appointed by people or they force their way into power. Church leaders, not appointed, should be anointed by God and they lead by agreement as they are called by him that big enough there are many examples of this in the Bible but I'm going to take Paul as the example because he was both when he was Saul he gained his secular leadership persecuting the church through his forceful character, gaining permission to imprison and kill Christians. And he pursued it relentlessly until he was anointed by Jesus in a particularly spectacular way. After which his leadership changed. It changed its goal and its style. Though he was the same person, with the same powers, the same strengths, he used them differently and with a new found humility. In 1 Corinthians, he says, I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace to me was not without effect. Secular leaders are often self-assured and self-seeking and seeking their own advancement. Church leaders, on the other hand, should be God-inspired and seeking the advancement of his kingdom. Wherever they are, in all circumstances, Paul, once again, writes to the Philippians from his imprisonment in Rome, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Stephen also even at his trial, he demonstrated that Jesus is the Messiah. 
to try and encourage his persecutors to follow him. Even in that circumstance. Secular leaders will often do all they can to gain power and to hold on to it to the last moment. We saw that last year, I think. Church leaders need to recognise when they're called, what they're called to, and when it changes, because it does. Sometimes it changes because, as I said earlier, they're tired, they're old, they need to rest. Other times it changes because there's another focus as the Holy Spirit leads us. In this and all other circumstances, we must listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, however they come, and be ready to obey them. Peter did this when he went to Cornelius' house. He had a message from God in a dream, listened, overcame his misgivings, and went. And the gospel became open to the Gentiles. And it was for the Gentiles' salvation as well as Israel. But aren't we glad he went? He could have stayed where he was. He could have clung on to his leadership of the whole church, well, the whole Hebrew church, in Jerusalem and not gone out on a risky venture. And it was risky in several ways. It was risky going there. It was also risky when he came back because he had to explain exactly why he went. He needed to defend, him, needed to defend himself. But he didn't. He listened to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, acted upon it, and went, despite the risk. Very often, as we have seen, I won't say recently, but <clears throat> secular leaders, adopters, a adopter, do as I say, not as I do, attitude, which can alienate people and lead to opposition. It's also setting a very poor example, which, if followed by everybody, will just lead to anarchy. Church leaders, on the other hand, are called upon to be examples of the lifestyle and the attitudes that they are encouraging others to adopt. Indeed, they are, they are called to be examples of the lifestyle that Jesus has called us to. Loving, caring, generous, and more. It's a high calling, and often we fall short but we must pick ourselves up and keep trying. There are many places in the Bible where we are told what leaders' lives should be like. I could go through them all, but we would still be here tomorrow. And I don't think that's really adhering to what I'm saying at the moment. <laughs> so I've chosen the section from Titus, which Mike read to us earlier. Beautifully, thank you, Mike. It tells us that leaders should be blameless, not overbearing. That's one I find difficult. I have to admit it. Not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain, but hospitable, one who loves doing good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined steadfast, encouraging, and ready to defend the gospel. Whoa, what a list. Who are you thinking about that list? Who could possibly be a leader? The Zappo box has stopped zapping. Oh, it's gone off. The slide that was on said, who could possibly be a leader? Who could possibly be a leader in the church? The answer is nobody in their own strength. But 
Praise be to God. We have the Holy Spirit who intervenes, strengthens, guides and protects us so that we can all aspire to various positions of leadership as he calls us. As Jamie pointed out last week, not everybody is called to be an eye or an ear. It, on, it only said who could possibly be a leader. An eye or an ear or a hand or a foot. We all have our own place and our own strengths which are God-given and which we should use to the best of our ability to make the whole body function each member, shall I try again? Nope. Oh well. Right. Hey, who could possibly be a leader? Thank you. I shall mention you in a minute. Yeah, we should use them to the best of our ability. To make the whole body function, each member needs to play its part with the support and collaboration of the others. In the same way, we're not all called to be elders or group leaders or work with children or make the IT and sound systems function. Thank you. <laughs> or stand up the front and sing. We must use the gifts that we have been given, not try to force ourselves into places that we shouldn't be. For example, if I asked Jamie to build a wall or to do some com a complex plumbing task, he would be the first to say to me, it's not his strength. <laughs> but he is a superb leader, speaker and evangelist with a heart for those things. They are his gifts. I, on the other hand, could build a wall and do some plumbing, but don't ask me to be a financial administrator, and certainly don't ask me to stand at the front and sing, unless you want the room to clear very quickly. We all have our gifts. We all have our strengths. We've all been given them by God. We can all be leaders. We can all be leaders in our own area. In the area that the Lord has given us to work in. We don't have to be a leader who stands at the front. We can be a leader in cleaning the floor. That's a job that is absolutely vital and needs to be done. And it needs somebody to come in and say, right, let's get on with it. That's being a leader. We can all be leaders where we have our gifts and where the Spirit guides us. And where we are. And in that way, we are used in the service of God. We just need to recognise those gifts though sometimes we need help from others to find them, <clears throat> then we need to actively search out where and how we can use them. So the answer's up there. We all can. With the Holy Spirit's guidance and help from other members of the body, remember the eye doesn't function all by itself. It needs the ciliary muscles, it needs the eyelid, it needs the brain, the nerves. We need help from others. But we all can. And now to the question. Have you found your function in the body yet? Perhaps it's time to chat with somebody, pray, and to do something about it. We, that is I, and I think Penny, will be by the comfy chairs at the end. <clears throat> if anybody wants to come 
and ask and pray and say, I feel that I can help in, we'd love it. So, if the Holy Spirit is prompting you, it's time to take him seriously, like Peter did.